Well, thank you very much, Admiral Bauer. Uh, and if I can invite you to join me here. And in the spirit and tradition of the assembly, we will take questions uh, from the floor. And I, I am sure there will be many of them. But uh, let me first start with this. The Arctic is a difficult term because it covers, if you add it all up, a vast part of the planet, almost the size of Africa. So I have sometimes divided it up into the West Arctic, which is basically Alaska and the northern part of Canada. The East Arctic, which is primarily seven time zones of Russia, plus the Arctic part of Finland and Sweden. And the Central Arctic, which is Greenland, Iceland, the North Atlantic, the northern part of Norway. When you talk about increased defense capability, as you did very extensively, and we thank you for that, where in the Arctic do you see this enhanced capability being primarily placed? Um, yeah, I think um, it very much depends on what Russia and China are doing. And primarily, first and foremost, Russia. Uh, I think that is uh, uh, um, our first and foremost threat at the moment. And therefore, uh, it depends on what the Russians are doing in the Arctic and in, in, in what way they are endangering our freedom of maneuver. For example, if the northern route would open, to give an example, we would have a new flank in the north, uh, which would actually mean that in terms of uh, uh, deterring and defending against the threats that are then also coming more from the north, you have to do more in that area. So I would say it is more, if I uh, listened correctly to you, the central and the eastern part of, of, the, Arctic. Uh, of the Arctic. Okay, so, yes, let's have a question here. In the center, can we bring the microphone quickly, please, and in introduce yourself, and don't make a statement, just put a question, please. Um, my name is Gustav Sigman, and I'm a Swedish citizen. Uh, and I think a lot of Swedes um, are sharing my concern and would like to know how sure can we be that we will actually be accepted as NATO members? Uh, that is first and foremost, uh, the process is as follows, and, uh, and part of the process has been done. I mean, it starts with nations asking to become a member. That has happened. Finland and Sweden have asked that. And then it's up to the members, now 30, to accept that, and that is done through a ratification process. In every nation that's different, because we are 30 sovereign states, and therefore the processes with the parliaments are different. Uh, we are now remarkably fast already. I mean, the, um, we are at 28 out of 30 that have ratified the accession of Finland and Sweden. And at the moment it's Turkey and Hungary that are still, that still have to do that. I'm convinced that uh, um, both nations will ratify um, the, uh, the membership of NATO. Uh, I don't know exactly the timing of, uh, of those ratification processes because that is, not, that is not in the hands of NATO, that is in the hands of those nations. Um, but, I, but I really believe, despite the issues that were on the table in Madrid with, uh, with Turkey, uh, that the, uh, the trilateral agreement between Turkey, Finland and Sweden is, uh, is, is going to work and, uh, and therefore uh, it is acceptable for Turkey as well. Okay, yes, there's one there at the back. My name is Gunnthor Ingason and I'm a retired Icelandic pastor. My question is simple also direct and also complicated to you, Admiral. What is your take on, on opinion of the recent plea of Zelensky, the present Ukraine president, to his Western allies 
that they assault Russia with a preemptive nuclear strike. Do I understand you correct that Zelensky would have said that he preemptively strikes Russia with nuclear weapons? Well, actually, he can't. He doesn't have nuclear weapons, so that is not possible. Oh, he's asking NATO to do that. Oh, uh, that will not happen. <laughs> so it's not, a, it's not a very difficult question, sir. Okay, it's uh, <clears throat> the former Arctic ambassador of the European Union, yes. Thank you very much, Admiral. In 2014... And maybe I can explain why I said, sorry, ma'am, why I said that, because it's the, uh, uh, the explanation to that is also important. NATO is a defensive alliance. NATO is a defensive alliance. There will, no be, there will not be a preemptive strike to Russia. We are not, NATO is not at war with Russia. It should be very clear to everyone in this room as well as in the rest of the world, we are not at war with Russia. So there won't be a preemptive strike from NATO to Russia. Very clear, thank you. Second yeah. try. Admiral, uh, in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea. And since 2014, it has been increasing its militarization in the Arctic, and tension has increased. We needed a war, the invasion of Russia to Ukraine, for getting an interest from NATO. Why has NATO been sleepwalking? Well, ma'am, uh, it's funny always that NATO gets the blames uh, for everything, especially when it is difficult. But actually, NATO consists of 30 nations. And it is the nations that allow NATO to do things or not. It was very interesting. I was in, uh, in, in, in Singapore and I met a Chinese delegation. And the Chinese general said to me that I should tell the nations that if they didn't behave properly, they would actually find the consequences with regard to China in the uh, South China Sea. And then I said to him, then you actually don't understand how NATO works. Because it's not me telling the nations what to do. It is the nations telling NATO what to do. And therefore, if you are using the term sleepwalking, then uh, we have been sleepwalking at 30. All the governments in all the nations were sleepwalking. And the discussions for many years already have been that some nations closer to Russia were very vocal about the threat, and other nations could not believe, did not want to believe, whatever term you want to say, that this could ever happen, that war would come back to Europe. And it has. Unfortunately, it has. And therefore, uh, I have to agree with you, not the sleepwalking part, but unfortunately, a war was necessary to make us all understand that this is still a possibility in the 21st century. I'll take the final question there, yes. Um, I have a uh, confidence that the President Grimson would give me this opportunity to ask the question. I'm the ambassador of China to Iceland. Uh, Admiral, with due respect, I should say that uh, your speech and remark is full of uh, arrogance and also paranoid. I think for Arctic region is an area for the high cooperation and low Low, low, low confrontation, and uh, that is what the Arctic Forum is for. In the past uh, several days, we have been listening to all the talks about how Arctic plays a very important role when it comes to climate change, when it's coming to the kind of, uh, you know, uh, temperature warming whatsoever. Actually, every country should be part of this process. China is the second largest economy in the world, and as the country that had a stakehold in the Arctic affairs. I think it's very, very not unhelpful to express the views that China should be kind of be guarded against or singled out from the cooperation. I, this is not a question, but I really I can't agree with the view. And I think that China as the peacemaker in the world, we will continue to make our due contribution to world peace, and we will continue to make our bit to the Arctic affairs and make our world a better place. Thank you. Well, Ambassador, I will try to rephrase your comment as a question. <laughs> <coughs> How would you react to that line which I'm sure you've heard before? Uh, why should we 
bring China into this discussion, which is primarily dominated by the war in Ukraine and what Russia is doing uh, in the Arctic? First, I disagree with the ambassador uh, that I have said that China should not be allowed to be in the Arctic. That's not what I said. Uh, what I said is that uh, if the intentions of uh, China are uh, opposing our values and interests and the rules-based international order, then NATO has to do some, has, NATO has to take steps uh, to, to make sure that we are able to deter and defend the threats that come from that direction. And, uh, sir, if you say you are the peacemaker of the world, I have a question for you, because you under, underline the principle of sovereignty and the importance of the, uh, of, the, of, of the internationally recognized borders in the world. I'm correct. Isn't that true? Yeah. So why is it possible, then, that China is still not condemning Russia's attack in Ukraine? Okay. Well, although, uh, although the time is up, I will allow this dialogue to continue. Yeah. <laughs> Ambassador. Uh, I'm sure brief, yeah, this brief. will be a very, very, very important and very good discussion. Let me tell you that China's foreign policy is a foreign policy for peace and independence. First of all, our, for, uh, we have independent thought. Secondly, we advance for peace. When it comes to independence, that means we think, we talk about the issue of the Ukraine crisis. We look at it from both the international uh, historic perspective and also the current perspective. We have a long-term perspective. We always advocate solving the problem from both the symptom and the root cause. We need to understand what's the root cause of this problem. Probably NATO has to think about it. You have a role, probably. Secondly, we are the peacemaker in the world. Look at the five members of permanent countries in the UN Security Council. China is the only country that has best track record when it comes to world peace. We have never launched a new war in the world. Look at some oh, other countries. Okay, okay that's my question. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, well, first of all, thank you for coming. <laughs> and thank you for... And thank you for bringing this uh, dialogue and discussion to this stage. And I think, uh, if I may say so, it uh, manifests the open democratic dialogue uh, of the Arctic Circle Assembly that both the former ambassador of the European Union and the present ambassador to China has been able to engage with you here, apart from the Swedish citizens who want to know how fast this process will Develop. So, thank you again for coming. Uh, we would be honored to have you again next year. I don't know what your schedule and your responsibilities are. But seriously, it would be very interesting in a year's time, in October, when we come together to hear your assessment of what has happened in the meantime and where we are heading. Because both at our conversation in München a week before the war or so when the two of us met. And also here today, it has been extraordinarily articulate and clear, even if some people in the audience don't agree with everything you say, but that is the nature of being a democracy. Exactly. Exactly. And therefore, let me here publicly invite you or somebody you appoint if you can't come to return to the States next year and, and uh, allow us to engage with you. We, of course, knew that China would be an important factor in this debate. Uh, China is still under some kind of COVID rules so far as uh, official travel is concerned. But uh, Gao Feng, who has been the Chinese Arctic ambassador for a long time, has been on this stage for a number of years before the war, made his first trip in three years out of China to be here with us. But in order to make sure we didn't kind of uh, heat the discussion up too much, which the distinguished ambassador and you indicated, we decided to let the Archbishop be between you and Carl <laughs> Fang, the Arctic Ambassador. Well, uh, you've uh, seen me heated up yet. But, uh. <laughs> so, thank you very much indeed. 
Looking forward to see you again in a year's time. Thanks very much.